All right, so we're starting on our next chapter here, chapter 21, entitled Carboxylic Acid Derivatives. Okay. And so all of our carboxylic acids, these uh, derivatives are these functional groups that have this same basic format where you have this carbonyl group that's attached to some electronegative atom. Okay, so it could be something like a halogen oxygen or nitrogen. These are these atoms we're going to see in this position here for our carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, and we're going to see that the types of reactions that these carboxylic acid derivatives undergo are different from our aldehydes and ketones, which do not have an electronic, uh, an electronic, an electronegative atom in that position, right? So uh, we still have that carbonyl carbon that's going to be relatively electrophilic. All right, that's going to be a common thread. Uh, but the difference here is the role that this electronegative atom is going to play. We're going to see it a little bit different. So let's take a look at these functional groups here, introduce them. Okay, we got a few different ones. They all behave fairly similar. All right, so if we have a halogen in this position, these are what we call acyl halides. All right, in particular, this one would be an acyl chloride because it's a chlorine in that position, but you could also have an acyl bromide. Uh, you'll also hear these called acid halides. That's not how I learned it, so that's not what I call them, but you will see that term as well. Okay, another one here is if we have an oxygen in this position. All right, but this is a special one where on the other side is another carbonyl group. This is what's called an acid anhydride. Um, another functional group with an oxygen in that position would be an ester. Okay, if instead of an oxygen and an ester, we had a sulfur that was attached to an alkyl group, this is what's called a thioester. All right, and then the last one is a nitrogen in that position. What's called an amide. All right, so in our umbrella of carboxylic acid derivatives, we're talking about these five specific functional groups here. And we're going to see a lot of overlap in the reactions of these functional groups. Um, in particular, what we're going to see a common thread is converting one of these uh, carboxylic acid derivatives into another one here. All right. Okay. But before we get started on our reactions, let's do nomenclature. Uh, I'm going to pick my battles here in terms of the, na the uh, functional groups of these five, the ones that we want to know how to name. Um, those are going to be the acyl halides, the esters, and the amides. All right? I don't care about the other two. All right, so... We take a look at the acyl halides 
and the Amides, we're gonna kind of lump those two together because they're fairly straightforward. So step one is, of course, to find that parent chain. For those acyl halides, the suffix on your parent chain is oil, O-Y-L, and then that halide name. For the amide, they made it easy, it's amide. All right, we don't have any substituents to worry about. And what about when we number our parent chain? What do we think is going to be carbon number one in both of these structures? The carbonyl carbon, right? Those uh, carboxylic acid derivatives, much like the carboxylic acids, they necessarily have these three bonds already. So they can only form one new carbon-carbon bond, which means that they will always be at locant one. All right, so our carbonyl carbon Is number one, so then are we gonna have to include it in the name? No, because it's gonna be implied that it's always on carbon one. So no locant in the name. And then we're gonna put it all together. All right, so this one here, this acyl halide is specifically an acyl bromide, right? We gotta specify our halogen. So this one here with its one, two, three, four carbons in its parent chain would be butanoyl bromide. Okay, our amide example here has these one, two, three, four carbons. And this is, so this would be butanamide. All right, so in both of these names, we have our bute for our four, car four carbons, the an to indicate that there are only single bonds, and then our specific functional group suffix. In the case of our acyl chlorides, it's that oil bromide, uh, acyl halides, it's that oil bromide, in the case of our amide, it's amide. All right, so let's do some examples real quick.
right, so I'm going to find my parent chain. I'm going to start numbering at that carbonyl carbon. So that means that this would be considered a substituent, specifically a methyl substituent, sticking off of that second carbon. So this would be 2-methyl propanamide. Right, pro, because my parent chain has the three carbons, and because they're all single bonds, and amide, because that's my functional group. All right, for this molecule here, we got a bunch of chlorines going on. All right, and just to be clear, the only one that's special, that's considered to be part of that acyl chloride functional group, is the one that it's attached to that carbonyl carbon, right? These are not special. These are just going to be counted as regular old chloro substituents. Okay, so I'm going to find my parent chain. I'm going to start numbering from that carbonyl carbon. All right, so in this one I have these two chloro groups at position three and four, so three, four, dichloro. All right, we got six carbons, so hex an oil, hex an oil, and this alkyl hal acyl halide is a chloride, so hex an oil chloride. With an E. <coughs> All right, so then the last one, esters, really nothing too crazy, but they do have a different kind of special consideration, consideration here in that they got these two chunks, right? So if we look here, let's just take a look at an example, ester. I got these two different parts of my ester here on either side of this oxygen in the middle here. All right, so for an ester, the chunk that contains that carbonyl carbon is always the parent chain. Doesn't matter if it's shorter than the other component. If it contains the carbonyl group, that's the parent chain of the molecule. The other half is going to be treated as a substituent. All right, and we'll sh you know, show you how to deal with that here in a second. Substituent. All right, so for the parent chain half, Again, we're going to find our parent chain, our longest continuous set of carbons that necessarily contains that carbonyl carbon of our ester. And for an ester, we use the suffix O8. Our new consideration here is going to be with the substituent. All right, and so specifically that, and I'm going to color it in green just like I did here, my ester substituent. Okay, we're going to name just as an alkyl group. So if this was my substituent in this molecule here, what would the name of that substituent be? One carbon. 
this is just a methyl group here. All right, but clearly we're going to have to build this into our name in a slightly special way here. Okay, so next we would number our parent chain. Again, number one is that carbonyl carbon. Okay, I'm gonna leave a bit, little bit of room down here though, because we're gonna add to this numbering business. Okay, and importantly now when we assemble our name, that ester substituent goes out front with a space between it and the parent chain. All right, so this one here, my ester substituent, I'm going to treat special. I'm going to put it out front of my name. So this would be methyl and then a space. We don't see spaces very often, but we have a space in our name here. This would be methyl. And now I'm going to refer to my parent chain, that four carbon with that O8 ending, methyl but anoate. Right, so out front is that special ester substituent. Followed by my parent chain, which is the fragment that necessarily contained that carbonyl carbon. All right, so let's just do an example here. All right, so if I chop this thing at this oxygen, hiya, which side is my parent chain, the left side or the right side? The left side. It, even though this is the smaller fragment, it contains that carbonyl carbon, so this is necessarily my parent chain, which means that this thing over here, these one, two, three, four, five carbons, that's that pentyl group. And since that pentyl group is a part of my ester substituent, it's going to go out front of my name here. So this would be pentyl space propanoate. All right, but let's throw some branch points in there.
Well, I mean, we're going to put one more methyl group in there to make a point. So again, my carbonyl carbon fragment is my parent chain. So these one, two, three carbons here are my parent chain, okay? Um, when I move to my other side, now I have this branch point in my fragment here. So I have to find, whoops. I have to find the longest continuous set of carbons. Okay, but we're going to treat this like a branched substituent. The carbon that is attached to that oxygen on my substituent is going to be carbon one of my substituent, of my ester substituent. So these four carbons here I treat as the parent chain. The one attached to the oxygen is always carbon one. So I said we were going to leave some numbering, uh, some space up here under our numbering for that ester substituent. Number one is attached to that ester oxygen. All right, so let's name our parent chain first because that's the more straightforward part. We have this methyl group coming off of our parent chain, and I'm going to keep it a different color here to make a point that this is a substituent on my parent chain. Uh, what locant is that methyl group located on? What number? Two. So my parent chain portion of my fragment here would be 2-methyl propanoate. And just to color code here, the 2-methyl refers to the substituent off of that propanoate parent chain. But now out front, I got to include that ester substituent, and it's got its own branch point. It's got its own methyl group coming off of carbon-1. And so just like we did uh, branch substituents for when we were just talking about alkanes, we're going to put this all into our name here. This would be 1-methyl. Then we're going to refer to the four carbons with still that YL ending. So 1-methyl-butyl. Notice that the substituents in that other part of my ester stays in that portion of the name and my substituent on the parent chain goes on the other side of the space. All right, so over here this whole thing is what we're going to call our ester substituent and everything over here is what's on our parent chain. Right, so this is what kind of makes esters, you know, we could kind of lump amides and acyl chlorides into the same group. All we need to do is learn a new suffix. For esters, they got these two components, these two halves to them, and we got to name both of those halves. All right, so then let's just do another example here.
right, and the way that it's actually drawn is going to be kind of nice here because we're going to see everything on this half is going to be in the first part of our name. Everything on the parent chain half is going to be in this part of our name. All right, so if I find my parent chain, it's got to necessarily contain that carbonyl carbon. So then my substituent off of my parent chain is this ethyl group. All right, if I number starting at that carbonyl carbon, I can see that this chunk is going to be 3-ethyl pentanoate. All right. But really what's going to precede that is this ester substituent here. I'm again going to find my longest continuous set of carbons over here. These one, two, three, four. I've got these two chloro groups. And I got to indicate the position of those chloro groups. I'm going to now looking just at my fragment, I got to number my fragment here. I'm going to start counting at that carbon that's attached to that oxygen. So this would be three, three dichloro, uh, butyl, space, three ethyl pentanoate. Right over here in this fragment, the three corresponds to my numbering scheme on my ester substituent. Whereas over here, the three corresponds to my numbering scheme of my parent chain. All right, so just to kind of color code our portions of our name here, so you can see where everything comes from. All right, so for esters, we got these two chunks. We got to name each of them in our name. We have this uh, kind of rare appearance of this space in our name here. All right. Let's start talking about reactions. Okay, so let's compare one of these carboxylic acid derivatives to a ketone here, or aldehyde or ketone. So over here we have an aldehyde or ketone. So that means that R is equal either a hydrogen or an alkyl group. And we're going to compare that to one of our carboxylic acid derivatives, which instead of using an R group, I'm going to use this variable Z to specifically denote one of these electronegative atoms. So this would be one of our carboxylic acid derivatives. I guess I can say Z equals electroneg. All right, so uh, what do these both have in common here? We both have these carbonyl groups. So we have this electronegative oxygen pulling electron density away from that carbon, making it a good electrophile. Not only does it have that sort of partial positive charge, but it's got that pair of electrons, that pi pair of electrons that can play the role of a leaving group should it get attacked by a nucleophile. Both of these have that same thing in common, right? 
So in both of these here, one of the common things we're gonna see is that our carbonyl carbon is an electrophile. That's gonna be the same for both our aldehydes and ketones, which we already covered, as well as these uh, carboxylic acid derivatives. All right, so that's what's gonna be the same about both of these. So let's look at what's different here. Let's take these and start a reaction. So for my aldehyde or ketone here, and then we're going to do side by side our carboxylic acid derivative. And since these are always going to be playing the role of the electrophile, let's just take generic nucleophile here. All right, and I want everybody to take a second and draw me my product of the first step in these reactions. Give me my mechanism here, my nucleophile attacking my electrophile, and let's take a look at the next step. So for both of these here, we see that we get this same looking intermediate here. We had a special name for it. What do we call this one? The tetrahedral intermediate, yes. So in both of these cases, we're going to generate our tetrahedral intermediate. All right, but this is where things differ. For our aldehyde and ketone, at this point it's stuck, all right? The only thing that we can do from here is to protonate. And depending on our reaction, sometimes we have clever things that we use to protonate. Sometimes it's just water or acid. But the bottom line is at our tetrahedral intermediate for aldehydes and ketones, we're stuck. And the only thing that we can do is protonate to create an alcohol group, right? And so this was this common reaction that we saw over and over again with aldehydes and ketones, what we called nucleophilic addition reactions, where we're adding that nucleophile to our carbonyl carbon. The big difference with carboxylic acid derivatives is that our electronegative atom is a good leaving group. All right, hydrogen and carbon, never going to play the role of a leaving group. That's why we were stuck. But if we have a good leaving group, then this tetrahedral intermediate can just rearrange itself and kick off that good leaving group. So we're not stuck with an alkoxide ion. 
Instead, what's going to happen is this pair of electrons is going to come down and kick off that good leaving group. Right? These electronegative atoms are pretty good at holding that electron density. Okay, so what we're left with is not an alcohol, but our nucleophile bound to a carbonyl carbon. All right, so if we look, the first step, exactly the same. We have a nucleophile attacking that carbonyl carbon, kicking that pair of electrons up onto that oxygen, generating what we call our tetrahedral intermediate. But with aldehydes and ketones, either the hydrogen or the alkyl group is a terrible leaving group, so it's stuck there. And the only thing that you can do is to go in and add some source of proton to protonate that oxygen. With a carboxylic acid derivative, because there's that electronegative <coughs> atom in that position, it's going to act as a good leaving group, so that tetrahedral intermediate can rearrange itself and kick off that good leaving group, leaving you not with an alcohol, but reforming that carbonyl group. Cool. All right, so let's talk about the reactivity of these uh, carboxylic acid derivatives. All right, so considering that that carbonyl carbon is going to be playing the role of an electrophile, I want everybody to take a second and see if they can't rank these from most to least reactive. All right, we're going to take three acyl chlorides, so we've got the same functional group here. So here is my electrophile. In order to react it, a nucleophile has to be able to attack it. So A, B, C. What do we think is the most reactive of these three acyl chlorides? Let's take a vote. Who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? Who thinks it's C? All right, so it is indeed A. Why A? Accessibility. Accessibility. It's just a very simple steric argument. Which one, are, you have to have a nucleophile be able to approach the electrophile in order for the reaction to occur. So the more accessible that nucleophile, or I'm sorry, the more accessible that electrophile is, the more reactive that molecule is. So then which one of these is gonna be the least reactive of the three? B, the one that's all crowded with those methyl groups, right? So if we're gonna rank these from most to least here, Um, or I guess the other way around, increasing reactivity, B is less than C, and A is the most. All right, and that's because of the accessibility of that carbonyl carbon. electrophile. All right, so if all three of these functional groups are the same and we're talking about reactivity, the more accessible that carbonyl carbon, the easier time a nucleophile is going to have approach, uh, approaching it and thus the more reactive. 
Okay, but then here is really going to be like kind of the heart of this chapter here, and that is comparing these different functional groups. Of all those five functional groups that we learned, those five carboxylic acid derivatives, we can rank them from the most reactive to the least reactive. Our most reactive are those acyl halides. super duper reactive functional group and we'll sort of explore why that is here in a second all right but that is going to be our most reactive followed by those acid anhydrides Then those thioesters. Then the regular esters. All right, and then finally the least reactive of our carboxylic acid derivatives are the amides. So we have nitrogen in that position. So here is what's up. Was that last trip previously we talked about the reactivity with like different accessibility? Yeah. What about um, different functional groups on the other side of the molecule? So like if it has if it's an acyl chloride and then it has like another substituent on the other side of the chlorine then like on the other side of the chlorine? Well like on the other side of the chlorine. So really, we're just going to simplify things to a crowding argument, a sterics argument. Like, you're, I think you're kind of asking, like, oh, what if there's an alcohol group over there or whatever? We're not going to learn about every possible mixture of functional groups. All, you know, all hell breaks loose at that point, right? We're going to sort of lay down a simple baseline of rules. And maybe there will be a special situation where, oh, a carbonyl group over here does something. But there's no like universal set of rules where we can say pick two random functional groups. What are we gonna? What what's that molecule gonna do? So we, we got to keep it kind of simple to to understand the baseline here. Okay. So first of all, before we talk about what it means to like most, actually, I guess let's start there. What does it mean to be the most reactive of these or the least reactive? All right. What that means is if I'm an acyl chloride, I can be easily converted into any of these other functional groups. Okay, we can easily convert an acyl chloride into any one of these other carboxylic acid derivatives. If we start out with an acid anhydride, I can be easily converted to anything less reactive, but not to an acyl chloride. All right, and this just keeps on going. So a thioester, we can turn into a regular ester or an amide, but we can't really get it back to the acid anhydride. All right, and then lastly, an ester, we can convert to an amide, but getting it into the other functional groups is much more difficult. All right, so what do we mean by more reactive? Okay, so more reactive functional groups
can be easily converted into less reactive functional groups. Yes, like this, like how simplicity of reaction conditions. It's not like it's impossible to go the other direction, but you need something real fancy to do it, and it's going to be real easy to go the other direction. And, and we'll see some examples here. So first of all, if I was going to start a synthesis, which one of these functional groups would I want to start with? Yeah, right. Those are the ones that I can turn into anything else. So absolutely, that's going to be the one that we want here. So now we answered the what. Let's think about the why. Why is it that an acyl chloride would be so much more reactive than, let's go to the other extreme, the amide here. Okay? So this just very simply goes back to what we were talking about, about our carboxylic acid derivative reactions, is what's different about those different carboxylic acid derivatives is what exactly the identity of that electronegative atom is, right? So the more reactive the functional group, the easier it is to kick this thing off, right? We're really just talking about what's the better leaving group. Chloride is an absolutely fantastic leaving group, super stable as the chloride ion. This thing right here, what would be my leaving group? Yeah, as specifically a carboxylate, right? Another very stable ion. It's got that negative charge that's stabilized through resonance. Here we have a sulfur. Eh, pretty happy bearing a negative charge. An oxygen, less happy. Trying to kick off an amide ion, a negatively charged nitrogen. Now you got a chore on your hands, right? Very difficult to do. So why are the, why, like, what explains this ranking here? Why is this ranking the way it is? More reactive simply means better leaving group. All right, so one more thing we're going to put on this list, and it's pretty much tied with an ester here. So we're going to go ahead and indicate that it's tied because it's also just an oxygen would be that carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids and esters are fairly interchangeable. All right. And there's going to be, and the one major path we're going to have to go backwards is starting with a carboxylic acid. We can get to that most highly reactive acyl chloride, but again, we got to use something kind of fancy here. All right, so this is going to be our first reaction that we learn about here is to prepare those acyl chlorides. Separation. And the way that we do that is with a carboxylic acid. All right, and using a reagent that we've seen before, thionyl chloride, SOCl2. Uh, to remind you all, when we first saw this reagent, it was with alcohols, and it replaced that hydroxyl group with a chlorine. And that's exactly what we're going to see here. If we start out with a carboxylic acid, we again replace that hydroxyl group with a chlorine. This is a much more complicated reaction. It's not just simply a nucleophilic substitution reaction. Um, but nonetheless, this is how we can go backwards. So 
if I'm starting out with, let's say, an, acyl uh, an acid anhydride, and I really want an acyl chloride, I'm gonna have to first turn it into a carboxylic acid, and then I can use my fancy method to go back, right? So that's the way that we have to go back to that most reactive functional group. All right, and since acyl chlorides are the most reactive, let's start there. So, let's just think here. If I'm starting out with this acyl chloride, how can I convert this into, let's just say, an ester? Let's go back to our like basic framework of all these reactions that we're gonna see here. So we're gonna have some nucleophile that attacks. That's gonna form this tetrahedral intermediate. But then that leaving group's gonna get kicked off, leaving me with my nucleophile now attached to that carbonyl carbon. So if I want to create an ester here, specifically this ethyl ethanoate business, all right, what would I use as my nucleophile? This chunk right here, right? That's got to be my nucleophile in this reaction, okay? So for example, we could use an alkoxide ion, that ethoxide ion, all right, and if we just want to do our mechanism here, that nucleophile is going to attack that electrophilic carbonyl carbon. We're going to form our tetrahedral intermediate. All right, and so then finish this up for me. What's going to be the next step? Um, you would you would probably just use the ethanol, the, the solvent version of that. But we're we're gonna learn. This is actually kind of overkill here. But let's just see. This is a simpler one. So, bottom line is from my tetrahedral intermediate, that pair of electrons comes down and kicks off that chloride ion. Right. So now my leaving group I've kicked off here. Okay. So for each one of these carboxylic acid derivatives, we're just going to use the nucleophile that matches what we're trying to swap out here. And honestly, that's going to be the common thread for all of these conversions that we're going to see here. For acyl chlorides in particular, though, we're going to make a note here. Um, this is a little overkill using this alkoxide ion. By that, I mean you don't need that strong of a nucleophile. You could get away with doing the same reaction with a weaker nucleophile, just the alcohol version, ethanol, 
all right? And so this works, but you're not gonna go and buy the alkoxide ion if the way, way cheaper alcohol version works just as well, okay? So we're gonna make a note that for our acyl chlorides, we can use the weak, AKA the neutral, version of our nucleophile. All right, cool. Then I want you all to tell me, starting with the following acyl chloride here. How could we make our other functional groups? So for example, what if I wanted the following thioester? or just a carboxylic acid. How could we do it? So this is my part that I'm trying to replace, right? But I'm going to use not this sulfur ion here with its negative charge. I could, but it's overkill. Instead, I'm just going to use the neutral thiol. And what about a carboxylic acid? Water, right? Yeah, I mean, why would you bother going and getting sodium hydroxide where you could just open up the tap? Use water, right? So that'll be how we create for acyl chlorides. We're gonna use the neutral or the weak version of our nucleophiles that we're trying to replace here. All right, we're gonna do the full mechanism for conversion of an amide because I wanna show something real quick. So everybody take a second and see if you can't get me the mechanism for this reaction here.
So my nuclear file is going to attack my electrophile, creating that tetrahedral intermediate. Once my tetrahedral intermediate forms, it's like, no way. Get out of here. Come on. Come back. I want that pair of electrons back down. I don't want to have to have that pair of electrons. Okay, but if we're noticed, we're not quite done yet. Because we use the neutral form of our nucleophile. We have this extra proton transfer step that we have to do. And in the case of amines in particular, because amines are such good bases, what we need to include in our nuclear, like sometimes we can get away with generic base or we'll default to water or something like that. For this in particular, because our amines are just such good bases and we know them to be such good bases, we have to use one of our amines as our base in this deprotonation step. And that'll take us to our amide. Product. Is that right? So the chloride ion is the same now? Yeah, it's just got kicked off. It's just floating around in solution. And maybe in some cases we'll play the role of the proton acceptor depending on the solvent, but in the case of our amides here, it will be the amines rather, it will be the actual amine itself playing the role of the base. All right, so because of that, often when you see these reactions written, you know, kind of just summarized here, our reagent list, It says two equivalents of the amine, whatever it may be. I find that to be excessive because normally you use a huge excess anyway, more than two equivalents, but nonetheless, we will see this here. And really that's just there to remind you that one of those equivalents is playing ro the role of the base and the other one is playing the role of the nucleophile. All right, so we can convert these acyl chlorides into any other of these uh, carboxylic acid derivatives um, using that nucleophile, in this case, our amine nucleophile. All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to uh, end this here so you guys can see your exams. All right, so uh, let's talk about exam three. So exam three is a very difficult exam, um, for sure. Uh, so, I mean, I'm sure everybody felt that way, huh? Number, yeah, okay, cool. So uh, the bottom line is we got to know exam three material, but I'm pretty understanding of the fact that exam three material is pretty dif uh, difficult. So. I don't know exactly how this is going to be done yet. I haven't made my decisions on scoring or anything like that. But I have made the decision that there will be an exam three makeup that will be optional and that will take place on the 24th of April. All right? It is going to be a makeup exam. You're not going to be like, oh, here's a free activity to get some free points. You're going to have to demonstrate to me that you understand that material, all right? But you'll get a second shot at it here, and that'll be, I think, in two weeks if I got that date right. Let me, let me double check that date. 